Can smoke out day, that's the day when millions of Americans are scheduled to kick the killer habit. Here in Houston, an anti-tobacco group has assembled a unique collection showing how an industry hooked a nation on a deadly product. Love News reporter Doug Miller shows us how a history of advertising has left a legacy of smoking. Generations have heard the message. Winston tastes good. Like a cigarette should. It has been inescapable. Marlboro country is everywhere. And now the advertisements are stockpiled in Houston. This is about uh, one third of the entire collection. The anti-tobacco group Docs Auto Care has amassed a huge collection. This is a medical journal. Showing how tobacco companies hooked generations of customers. These are the most incredibly creative people in all of advertising. Imagine if you had 70,000 scientific reports saying that your stuff caused death and disease and you were still able to increase sales year after year after year. Under the boxes of memorabilia stacked in this southwest Houston office, there's evidence of tobacco marketing to children, like this car bearing the name of Marlboro, and plenty of packs of candy cigarettes. Winston's got that filth of plenty. Videotapes gathered here show how tobacco tapped into popular culture. Give me a cigarette, will you have? Don't say cigarette, say Philip Morris. And how television finally told Americans the truth about tobacco. But if you think cigarette ads are just museum pieces from the past, think again. Just last week, you had the Winston drag races from Baytown. Nothing has changed. They've just adapted. And that means this huge collection just keeps on growing. Bye-bye, folks. Good smoking. In Southwest Houston, Doug Miller, 11 News. And about the smoke out, it can be done. I quit five and a half years ago, so you can do it. Just have to work you. on it. Work on it. Good. Good for you. Congratulations. A new museum is in the works for our fair city. The anti-smoking group DOC, which stands for Doctors Ought to Care, wants to build a permanent home for millions of historical documents that it has collected, chronicling tobacco and its hazards, as well as numerous of dis displays showing how things from sports clothing to statuettes and the Internet are used to influence potential smokers. I'd love to have someone coming out of this museum saying, gee, I never thought about it like that before. It's even scarier in many ways because this industry is so clever and creative and is able to get involved in the arts and sports and all the things that we like to do. The group's goal is to raise two million dollars. That project kicks off tonight at the Moose Cafe and it is open to the public. In our next story we're going to meet a remarkable family physician. Just over 20 years ago he founded DOC, Doctors Ought to Care. Patricia Grouse introduces us to a man who's devoted his career to questioning the promotion of tobacco and alcohol. Here is U.S. News and World Report. Right? How to reverse heart disease, okay? Let's take a look and see what they say about how to reverse heart disease. <laughs> One sentence on smoking. One sentence, okay? And how about, let's take a look at Sports Illustrated, Newsweek, and U.S. News, and Time Magazine, the Russian Revolution, all this important information, right? Different stories, exciting information, and yet it's the same old story on the back of it. <laughs> Dr. Alan Bloom's most powerful arsenal against smoking and drinking too much is humor. He says, laughing the pushers out of town. We take out one of our little stickers that has a Marlboro man with a slash going through him and it says, many of the ads in this publication are misleading, deceptive, and a ripoff. For example, smoking does not make one glamorous, macho, successful, or athletic. It does make one sick, poor, and dead. And you take that and you slap that right on the thing like that. He's the executive director of DOC, Doctors Ought to Care. For over 20 years, he has tried to change attitudes molded by what he says is misleading advertising in the mass media. Bar for a barf bag. It says the cigarette advertising make you sick, us too, and it's a place for people to throw up into the... Well, in any event... My father got me interested in looking at the whole tobacco advertising issue when, as a family doctor, he was very concerned about the association of cigarette advertising with sports. So if you go back to the uh, 50s when I started taping ads off of television and, and see the difference, you won't find a whole lot of difference today. In effect, instead of having uh, the baseball player for Lucky Strike, today they have the billboard for Marlboro behind the outfielder. So it's really something that we've kept track of for the last 30, 40 years and nothing very much has changed. 
Today, DOC has one of the largest historical documentation of the tobacco industry, known as the DOC Tobacco Archives. In addition to um, monitoring the industry and the whole anti-smoking movement, one of the things that we've tried to track is the corporate allies of the industry. And this is just one of many examples. This is Kodak. This is in diagnostic imaging. Uh, this is an ad for Kodak, which uh, makes the film that the lung x-rays are, are printed on. Um, but they're also, for many years, were the uh, number one manufacturer of cigarette filters. So it's just sort of an ironic connection that we try to follow. Now, almost 30 years after the Surgeon General determined smoking caused disease, Blum disagrees tobacco companies secretly conspired against the public. When it comes down to smoking, um, the government was involved with the tobacco industry. They still are with the tobacco subsidies. The American Medical Association, the leading health organization, was involved with the tobacco companies. They, they didn't hear, see, or say any evil for so many years. And all of the major health organizations were always fearful of really going after the source of the problem, which is the tobacco industry. But all we're alleging, my colleague Eric Solberg and I, is that many people also knew. The media corporations, ABC, NBC, CBS in particular, covetous of cigarette advertising revenue, knew exactly what was going on. They were covering the dangers of smoking, but they chose to act in the interest of the advertisers. After tobacco companies were prohibited from advertising on TV in 1969, they began to sponsor sports, culture, and education events, and many of those were covered on TV. A key component of DOC's strategy is to monitor the tobacco industry like a parasitic disease. We use a map to see where they're going to be in our communities, a calendar to see when they're going to be there, often nights, weekends, and holidays when the kids are out of school. And above all, we use a camera. They don't like that. Excuse me, sir. Can I ask you not to, to video videotaping sampling? Oh, why is that? Because we don't, we don't allow it. You don't we allow it? Why not? We just, we can't because of our sampling rules. We can't allow it. You can't allow it, but this is public property. While cigarette smoking has become less fashionable among higher income Americans in recent years, the fact remains that the prevalence of cigarette smoking has declined on average by less than 1% per year in the United States. Tobacco companies and their allies in the advertising business have worked very hard to identify new customers. As a result, women, ethnic groups, and teenagers have become the primary targets of the tobacco industry. As they monitor the tobacco industry's every move, Doc fights the battle for consumers with the same weapon, advertising with a twist. It's a bittersweet feeling for me to look at the ferocious assault on the tobacco industry, something which we in our organization pioneered over 20 years ago. But they really didn't see the broader picture, and they didn't look at advertising as we did, and they didn't see the importance of making fun of it as opposed to trying to ban everything they didn't like. So the bittersweet feeling is that people have caught up with us now, and they've even gone by us in their ferocity toward the tobacco industry. But what they've missed is a sense of, how do we reduce smoking among adolescents? How do we do that? You don't do it by wagging your finger and saying, don't do this, and you're going to get lung cancer, and Joe Camel is evil. You do it with a sense of humor. And I think that's what's lacking. The idea behind Doc's ads is to get people laughing at advertising efforts to get people to smoke. And as with all of these ideas, we need to get them out into the community. Image for image, we need to fight Madison Avenue's promotion of cigarettes. It's only when young people begin to see through these images that we will truly begin to end the tobacco pandemic. This, he says, and not legal settlements. Uh, I only wish that we had had that opportunity to sit down at that table with those tobacco companies and, and with the lawyers on our side of the fence and stop looking just at the money and start looking at how do you really reduce consumption. Tobacco companies have settled with Texas for $15 billion. But one of their greatest challenges now is a historic settlement with the federal government, which could mean new strict regulations for cigarette makers and billions of dollars in government coffers. I'm Patricia Gross for Weeknight Edition.